Greetings ladies and metal gents and welcome to this patch video for Mud's mission taken from the website Royal Road. As always I hope that you all enjoy this episode and if you do please consider supporting the channel. Also all of these episodes will be available as a podcast on the various different podcast platforms. All the links will be down below. Chapter 37 Mob's Boss after clearing the outside area, getting twelve more magical beasts, Mud proceeded into the cave. Within the level of the filth was the uneven greater. The gooey brown slime covered the floor and the smoke with poorly ventilated fires clung to the roof of the cave. Continuing to slaughter the sleeping forms, Mud advanced deeper. After getting five more goblins, the golem once again increased its soul refinement. Master Butler Rare Class has increased to level three. By now, the returns were pitifully small. Each goblin only granted four experience. Proceeding down the surprisingly deep tunnel, a side passage became apparent. Turning to check the contents, Mud was surprised to find that it contained three humans. They all appeared to be heavily wounded, although two appeared to still be alive, judging by the regular breathing. Proceeding into the room, Mud killed the seven goblins around the humans. Searching their ragged clothes, Mud found a few coins, which it took into its body. Then the golem left and returned to its hunting. Mud proceeded further down the narrow tunnel. After a sharp bend, the tunnel opened up into a wide amphitheater, natural light filtering in from the crack in the roof. Within, Mud witnessed something they had not seen so far, an awake enemy. While they resembled a goblin, the creature was much larger and more muscular. Were it not for the green skin, the beast could easily be confused for a rather ugly and short human. On its head it wore a metal helmet and a torso of chainmail, likely stolen from the captured humans. On its side hung an unsheathed sword, merely tied to its armor with a rope. Best match, Goblin General. Magical beast Goblin General, a goblin that has strengthened its soul to the point that it has ascended to a higher realm of power. Although goblins are prolific, Few survive long enough to become generals, medium risk class, tier 2. The goblin general was violently shaking and slapping the nearby sleeping goblin. When the target of its frustrations refused to wake, it moved to another and began shaking it as well. Just as it prepared to slap the helpless sleeping form, the general was suddenly bent in two and rocked backwards, slamming into a nearby wall with a resounding crash. Chunks of rock flew in all directions, but a moment later the general was back on his feet, brandishing his short sword and looking around for an enemy. Taking full advantage of the limited intellect, the general decided to first examine the direction of the strike that it seemed to come from. Showing no concern for its sleeping kin, the goblin stomped heavily to the other sleeping forms. Arriving at the entrance of the cave from the side, the general crouched low. With a sudden explosion of movement, it leapt in front of the entrance and swung its sword into the gap with a roar. Finding no enemy there, the goblin stepped back and looked around, scratching its warty green head. Unbeknownst to the general, the foe was directly above it, its brown skin blending perfectly in with the stone walls of the cave. Stealth skill has increased to level 6. Silently, Mud released its grip off the cave wall. In the instant before it landed on the Goblin General, the Goblin released the force bolt that it had charged, slamming the Goblin into the cave floor. Following the bolt, Mud landed heavily on the beast's back, wrapping its tentacles around it. Unfortunately, the dagger was unable to penetrate the chainmail the beast was wearing, and it did no damage. Wasting no time, Mud manipulated his form to trap the General in a cocoon of mud. The general would not go down easily, however, showing surprising tenacity despite multiple bleeding wounds and labored breathing. It had once again returned to its feast, dropping its sword. The goblin began grabbing out handfuls of flesh and tearing them off. Maximum HP reduced by one. Realizing too late what the general was doing, the golem racked with pain and self-loathing was failing its master. As the general reached for another handful, Mud focused on making the section of it with the denser stone. This increased strength gave the general pause, but it soon redoubled the efforts and wrenched the offending mass free. Wanting to end the fight as quickly as possible, Mud transferred the dagger from its torso up to the tip of its mud tentacle, whipping the blade around in an attempt to slice the magical beast's neck, as it had done with so many sleeping forms already. 
As the blade flew towards the beast's undefended neck, its right arm suddenly stopped pulling the rock like mud and snatched the tentacle mid-swing. Grinning with crooked teeth, the general tightened its grip suddenly, causing the end of the tentacle to fall to the cave floor. Maximum HP reduced by one. Deprived of its weapon, Mud quickly formulated a new plan to kill the monster. First, Mud released a point-blank force bolt directly into the monster's torso, causing it to stumble. While he was distracted, Mud rapidly slithered up the general's back and rapidly encased its entire head. The goblin general began clawing away at the offending material in a panic. Maximum HP reduced by one. It was too late. Once in position, the golem hardened its entire outside layer into a stone-like consistency and waited. Although the goblin was able to find its discarded sword and strike mud repeatedly, the dull and rusted blade did no damage against the stone-like exterior. After a short time, the monster finally suffocated and collapsed to the floor. Weary of the lack of experience, Mud carefully extended a tentacle and snatched its dagger and slit the beast's throat. Its skin was thick and Mud was surprised at the difficulty it experienced reaching the carotid artery. Eventually, its effort bore fruit and the cave floor was stained with red of the Goblin General's blood. Experience gained 40. The fight had proven much more difficult than Mud had expected. The rewards, however, were great. After reabsorbing his lost mass, Mud returned to the original task. After killing eight more goblins, it had gained enough experience for another level. Master Butler Rare Class has increased to level 4. Killing the remaining 36 goblins, it um, unfortunately did not even gain enough for a level, receiving only two experience from each. Although all the goblins were now dead, its work was not yet done. Over the next half an hour, Mud removed the proof of subjugation, the goblins left ear from each corpse. Partway through the labor, the humans woke up. End of chapter. Chapter 38, Macabre Rescue It becomes apparent to all those who've learned that a physical body is nothing more than a flesh prison for divine spark within us all. In the millennia since the creation of the Akashic Records, much has been learned from the mundane methods by which these vessels for the soul operate. Blood circulates vital nutrients, the brain stores wisdom, muscles provide strength. All this is known. This is not the true form of life, however. Such physical contrivances are merely crutches that ease the burden of the soul as it articulates your existence within the domain of the Demiurge. Even those of you here for the first time should be familiar with this concept. The soul's ability to reflect its own ideal form upon the mundane is innumerate in each of your records and statistics. As the soul grows in strength, physical reference points are unneeded. As the small effects that a pace all the system provides become trivial. If one has the will and strong enough power of soul to decide to live even with all their blood spilled, they will live. Surely you've heard of the legends of the elder dragon Deluvia, who lived and recovered after being reduced only to bones. Such is the power of strong will which can maintain its emanation and the mundane realm even in the most extreme of circumstances. And should some day we reach the realm of gods, the vaunted tenth tier, no physical aspect will be needed at all. Sermon from the Church of the Venerable Gnostics, City of Galtheus Mud carefully sliced off another goblin ear and absorbed it into his chest cavity. In the distance, he could hear the excited yelling of the two living humans. He's not waking up. Why isn't he waking up? The sobbing voice of a woman echoed down the tunnel to where Mud continued moving ears. A shaky male voice followed. Claire, he's dead. We need to get out of here before more show up. Be quiet. They might hear you. No, Hale. No, you can't be gone. Such arguing continued for some time. It didn't seem very efficient to use time to mud. Heedless, the golem continued removing ears. The male voice yelled out again, but this time sounded much closer. Hello, is there a hunter around here that killed all these goblins? Please take us back to town with you. We're just merchants. We can't make it alone. We'll reward you. Mud stopped its efforts and dislodged the uncooperative ear and returned its dagger to the smutty sheath. Extracting the carefully folded robe from its rather stuffed torso, Mud carefully draped it over its shoulders and proceeded towards the voice. 
Orders from humans are curious thing. Before getting them, Mud wanted to avoid them as much as possible. After all, any new order was likely to make it much more inconvenient to follow the master's orders, or to get in the way of some current sub-goal. Once the order was actually received, however, it was a joy to fulfill. Mud felt an immense amount of satisfaction fulfilling the master's will in such a direct and unambiguous fashion. Recently, many of the golem's actions have been several layers removed from the master's orders, a rather frustrating situation. For example, it was currently removing goblin ears so that it could sell the ears so that it could use the money to get stronger, so that it could win the dungeon festival contest, so that it could prevent the powerful individuals from taking the master's sword, so that it could follow an order. This is entirely too many layers. At the time, like this, a straightforward task like do what humans tell you to do because the master said so was very welcome. Rounding the small entrance to the main tunnel, Mud proceeded a short distance until they saw the ragged, scared-looking human that had passed before. The human leaned heavily against the nearby cave wall, seemingly having difficulty with the mere act of standing. Quickly, forming a mental bridge between itself and the two humans as it rapidly approached, Mud sent out a message. I killed the goblin here. I'll escort you to Galtheus. Follow me. The man was startled by the voice and seemed to come from no direction. Looking around rapidly, it took a moment for him to spot the black cloak figure approaching in the dark tunnel. Oh, thank you. I'll go grab Claire. Just a moment. Mud waited patiently outside the small cave. Of course, he removed more ears as it waited. Come on, Claire. The hunter is going to take us back to town. No, we can't leave, Hale. A short argument ensued, and a moment later, the man returned to the door. I'm sorry, but uh, it seems our friend died. Could you carry him back with us to the city? He deserves a proper burial, but we're too weak to carry him. I will carry the body to town. Saying that, Mud proceeded into the cave and immediately hefted the corpse of the somewhat short man onto its back. With its recently increased strength, it was easily manageable. Between sobs, the filth-covered woman managed to choke out a few words of gratitude. Th th thank you! As the three left the cave, they immediately noticed a group of four living goblins examining a corpse. Judging by the rabbit they were carrying, they had just returned from a successful hunting trip. Both goblins and the humans reacted with the shock and fear there was appearance of the other group. However, Mud calmly continued walking. A moment later, one of the goblins' heads exploded, followed by another. False bolts finished off the other two before they could flee to the safety of the forest. The male captive stared at the wide-eyed in bewilderment. Wow, hunters are crazy. I didn't even see your attack. Mud continued at a steady pace, slicing off the ears of every beast that passed. The corpse of Hale held fast as to its back by ribbons of Mud's cloak. Stepping rapidly and dragging the still despondent female by the arm, he caught up with the golem a moment later. Did you kill all these by yourself? There's so many. I killed all the goblins. Such power. And you look like you're less than ten years old. I am less than ten years old. Taking one more look around the carnage, the man noticed that each corpse had only a single clean wound on their neck. Looking back at his savior, he noticed that there wasn't even a single drop of blood in the boy's cloak. Even as they walked, carrying the corpse of an adult with no apparent burden, the child was effortlessly slicing off the proof of subjugation of each goblin they passed. Not even slowing down. What kind of life would make a child so powerful at such a young age, and to be so unmoved by a corpse? This kid wasn't ordinary. What's your name? I'm Mud. The trio traveled into the woods towards the city of Galtheus. Unfortunately, Jabrax was long gone and could not assist with this job. Mud felt the demon return to its domain not long after it began killing goblins. The golem would have to educate her about the importance of staying within support range during an infiltration when it got home. Readjusting the stiff burden on its back, Mud led the way. End of chapter Chapter 39 Mission Complete Mud, Claire, and the man whose name it turned out was Frederick traveled west through the woods. Their movement through the thick underbrush was rather slow due to the injured state of the humans. At one point, Mud offered to simply carry the both of them, but they were unwilling to lie on top of the corpse of their friend for some reason that Mud couldn't comprehend. 
After an hour of travel, the sun finally dipped low and cast the forest into a gloomy darkness. Perhaps due to the recent trauma, both Claire and Frederick showed remarkable caution and observation skills. The two of them spun rapidly to every noise and constantly scanned the depths of the dark forest. An attention to avoiding blind spots the golem could appreciate. They also stuck close to Mud's side at all times, a tactically wise choice. Do not needlessly yell, it might attract predators. Both the humans redoubled their scanning efforts in the golem's reminder. Mud wasn't sure what they were looking around had to do with staying silent, but that patterns of the humans often left it perplexed. Ignoring the strange antics of the pair, Mud fired another force bolt silently into the night, killing a grey wolf that was observing it. The experience gained three. Spooked by the display of strength, the remaining five wolves fled into the wilderness. This had been a regular occurrence during the trip back to town. It seemed that monsters were attracted to the party. Perhaps the smell of the corpse or the wounded humans was to blame. Regardless of the reason, the steady stream of magical beasts had approached the group during the travels. During this time, Mud even saw its first kobold. Traveling alone, the kobold wore light but well-fitting leather armor, a combination of scales and patches of fur giving the short magical beast an unusual look. Its pointed snout and rows of razor-sharp teeth, and its movement appeared to be much more refined than those of the goblin. When they described to the Albanac, Mud was surprised to find the kobold had stalked the group was in fact an advanced member of the species. Best match, kobold scout. Magical beast kobold scout. A kobold who has refined its soul to a class of a scout. This magical beast has much better stealth and escape abilities than a normal member of its race, but retains the trademark cunning. Its abilities to stealth were indeed impressive. Mud had only been able to spot it due to its unceasing habit of constantly looking in every direction, combined with its ability to see clearly in very low-light situations. When learning about human anatomy, the golem had discovered that their eyes functioned very poorly without enough illumination. In Mud's experience, it seemed to be the case with most creatures. Even the kobold scout seemed to come closer than was strictly necessary to gain line of sight likely due to the oppressive darkness of the forest. The scout's escape ability also displayed itself when Mud tried to assassinate the peeper. Moments before the inevitable force bolt struck, the scout nimbly dodged to the side. A moment later, it vanished behind a tree and Mud lost sight of it. Claire and Frederick shrieked yet again and howled each other in a sudden noise in the force bolt slamming into a tree. Frederick grumbled, c c can't you light a torch or something, Mud? The darkness is getting to me. No. No? Well, how long until we get to the town? If we can't be far now, we've been walking for so long. At our current rate of travel, we will arrive in Galthais in approximately two hours. Both humans groaned and helped each other tighter. Mud was again perplexed by the humans. It had expected them to be happy that they would reach the town before they risked dehydration or exposure. Instead, they seemed upset. Putting their illogical actions out of his mind, Mud shifted his focus to the red deer in the distance. It wasn't a threat to the group, but it would provide experience. The golem fired another bolt into the darkness. Experience gained one. Over the course of the two hours, Mud picked off large numbers of forest residents, unbeknownst to the oblivious humans. Partway through, it received a long-awaited level. This time, Mud chose to strengthen his soul. More hit points had been lost than expected against the Goblin General. Hit points would be vitally important until a way to prevent itself from being torn apart could be devised. Mud had an idea in that regard, but no matter what countermeasures it devised, hit points would always be an important buffer. Mud Golem species increased to level 7. What occurred after that latest level was disheartening, although not unexpected. Experience gained zero. Every enemy killed after the latest level had granted no experience whatsoever. Mud was not hopeless about raising its level, however. When the Goblin General had died, a large amount of experience had been gained. It was possible that the General had simply granted an unexpectedly massive amount of experience, but there was another possibility that seemed more likely. The General had both a higher risk and tier than any other enemy Mud had killed so far. Likely, one of those aspects negated the experience reduction, or perhaps some third value was at play. 
Regardless, mud would simply need to fight more powerful foes in order to increase its power. Eventually, and without any major incident, the trio finally arrived at the gates of Galtheus. Upon exiting the woods and gaining sight of the impressive city walls, the two humans burst into tears and cheered excitedly. As they approached the archway, one of the guards hastily stood from the chair and jogged over to them. Hold it! What happened here? Scanning the two injured humans, the guard's line of sight finally fell on mud. Upon noticing the dead man strapped to his back, her eyes grew wide and she yelled back to the other guard, Zeke, get out here, we got trouble! The other guard, a demi-human with a wolf-like features, after looking for a moment, sprang up from where it laid on the ground and dashed over to the group. What's wrong? Looking at the new arrivals, he added, Oh, wow. Stop gawking and go wake the healer out on duty. Oh, and grab a stretcher and someone to help the stuff. Turning back towards the group, she added, um, No offense. Claire's face scrunched up, but she didn't say anything. At this time, Frederick spoke. We were captured by goblins on the road into town. This hunter rescued us, killed all the goblins too. He's young, but really strong. He even carried hail all the way from the foothills to get a proper burial. The guardswoman looked down appraisingly at Mud. Very noble of you. Say, have you ever considered joining the city guard? Moments later, a childish yet strangely monotone voice appeared in her mind. No, I have not. I'll give it some thought. We could use someone like you. Mud immediately gave it some thought. There did not seem to be any advantage to joining the city guard, so he would not do so. While Mud considered its own lack of interest, Zeke returned with the interior of the wall, followed by a grey-haired man in a rainbow-coloured robe. The old man was forced to lift the robe with both hands in order to keep up with the jog of the much more fit Zeke, and huffed and puffed at the exertion. Finally returning to the group, Zeke gave a sharp salute and stood straight. Mission complete. The gaunt woman rolled her eyes. Yeah, good job, Zeke. The demi-human smiled wide in satisfaction and stood tall at the compliment, tail wagging wildly. Turning towards the priest, she continued, Heal up these civilians, they got attacked by monsters. Producing a small brass figurine that resembled a snake with a lion's head, the priest walked around the Claire and Frederick and began channeling the opalescent energy of their bodies. Before Mud's eyes, the wounds closed and the bruises faded. The guardswoman turned back to Zeke. Where's the stretcher and somebody to help with the body? Zeke paled his eyes and mouth agape. After a moment, Zeke turned and sprinted back towards the gate. S -s Sorry, sir. I I'll get it now. End of chapter. Chapter number 40. Making money. Who were the ancient empire that crafted the Akashic Records? It should come as little surprise that the name Ancient Empire is a modern invention. In their own time, they were certainly not ancient. Unfortunately, the true name of their civilization has been lost to time. Or, perhaps more accurately, scoured from existence. The extreme lack of information regarding the Ancient Empire, despite its obvious scale and power, has led many scholars to believe that some outside force intentionally expunged them from history. Even the vaunted grand art or great art, the Empire holds very little information of its own creator. Thus far, very few things have been concretely identified about the Empire. It is known that they were human-biased in their use of language. Some argue human supremacists, though there is no solid evidence of this. It is known that the Empire possessed great skill and power in manipulating the fabric of reality. It is theorized that, at a minimum, it would require multiple tier 9s to craft the Akashic Records. And finally, it is known that they crafted the Akashic Records. Aside from those three facts, nothing is known for certain about the Empire or their people. Personally, I believe that they were destroyed as an unforeseen side effect of crafting the record. It seems fitting to a magic design to spread knowledge could backfire by destroying knowledge. Or, perhaps they angered a god with their arrogance and were smote in recompense. That is, of course, merely speculation. Until more information surfaces, the fate of the ancient empire will remain a mystery. Excerpt from the History of the Akashic Records The furry dog-eared demi-human reappeared a moment later with a stretcher and a fit man in casual clothing. 
Mud recognized him as one of the guards playing cards at the gate when it had entered the city previously. His hair was ruffled and he let out a yawn, but despite his discomposure, he performed his job admirably. Zeke and the guardsmen unwrapped the corpse and hail from Mud's back and gently placed him on the stretcher, then carried him back towards the city. Turning towards the rescued male human, Mud crafted a paracosia. I've delivered you to Galtheus. Give me a reward. The man shifted uncomfortably and gestured towards the tattered clothes. Um, I'm afraid I don't have anything with me at the moment. It'll take me some time to get resettled. Is there any place I can send you a reward at a later date? Um, I understand it was my life at stake, so it will be suitable, I assure you. Send my reward to the Sithlar estate. Anyone who answers the door there may accept the reward in my place. The man bowed deeply. Thank you so very much. Really, thank you. The woman stepped closer and suddenly lunged forward and wrapped Mud in a powerful grip. Is this an attack? Mud began charging a force bolt. Thank you. After a moment of more tight squeeze, the woman released her grip and stood. Then the two humans were led towards the interior and the walls by the guardsmen. Mud dispersed the force bolt. As Mud prepared to leave, the guardswoman called over his shoulder. Wait, there, I'll be right back. Mud immediately stopped all movement frozen in place. The guardswoman disappeared into the interior wall for only a moment and then returned to Mud's position and handed him a slip of paper. Mud made no motion to take it. Well, go on and take it. Can I stop waiting now? Came the monotone male voice. Huh? Oh, yeah. No sooner had the words left her lips that the cloaked arm snatched the paper out of her hand. The paper appeared to be an official form printed from the watermark with the seal of Cathars. Sloppy handwriting on the black ink covered its surface. Commendation for the rescue of two civilians and the recovery of one civilian remains. Witness, Guard Captain Renmar, Guard Zeke. Mud stared at the slip of paper for a moment, perhaps sensing the golem's incomprehension, she explained. You're a Delver, right? Hand that to the association and you can get some credit with them. We could just reward you ourselves, but it helps you out more if you do it this way. Mud tucked the precious paper into his cloak. How did you know I'm a Delver's association member? Captain Renmar smirked and crossed her arms. We have ways of telling. One Dalva throwing a fit can do more damage to a city than a ride of a hundred civilians. It only makes sense to keep a special eye on you. Mud did not like having a special eye on it. Turning towards the gate, Mud proceeded towards the city. Um, goodbye. What a weird kid. Sliding over the cobblestone bricks, Mud retraced the path back to the Dalva's association. In the back of the night, the city was very different. There were much fewer humans and the demi-humans walking the streets for one thing. All of the shops and carts in the streets bazaar were closed, aside from a few food stalls. The few sapiens still on the streets were also acting more erratically, singing loudly or clinging to each other in the dark alleyways. Often, Mud heard humans shouting about the upcoming festival excitedly. Eventually, Mud arrived at the association. Entering to the towering white building, the golem was surprised to see that it was nearly the same as it during the daytime. Crowds still filled the tables and surrounded the bull wall, the room brightly lit with heated filaments in the roof. Turning right from the entrance, Mud got into the lines behind a thick human woman with glowing purple eyes. As Mud finally reached the front of the line, he was greeted by a bald, wrinkly-faced man with a wispy white beard wearing a vibrant colored plaid vest. Despite his age, the old man spoke energetically. Hello there, what business do you have with the association today? My goal is to exchange several items in my possession for money. A look of surprise momentarily crossed the old man's face as the illusion struck him. He gave Mud a quick scan with his eyes. Oh my, you're the new kid Vidya told me about. She was right about potential. You only signed up earlier today and you really have something to turn in. Well, let's see what you got. Oh, and your card, please. Mud immediately produced his card and placed it on the table, along with the note that it had received from the human guardsman. Oh, we rescued some civilians. The old man looked up from the paper and nodded towards Mud with a smile, revealing several missing teeth. A few remaining, however, sparkled pure white. Good on ya. It's up to a strong to help out the weak. We're all in this together and all that. So, what else do you have for me? 
At his prompting, Mud began setting goblin ears on the table, one at a time. As the golems steadily placed fresh ears on the table, transformations came over the teller's face. First, disappointment, then admiration, then surprise, then incredulousness. After Mud placed the final, normal goblin ear on the table and placed the goblin general ear on the table, he could no longer stay silent. And a goblin general too? You're only a tier one kid? You didn't actually do this alone, did you? The old man squinted at Mud, mouth a thin line. No, I was assisted by Jabrax the Red. The old man raised his eyebrows, perhaps not expecting such a blood answer. So she's the other one you joined with, right? The old man seemed to relax at this. Look, your news, I'll let you off. But if you do work with another Dalva, you're supposed to give them credit, all right? Rank is important to some people, and forgetting to tell us can get you into hot water down the road. I understand. Nodding in satisfaction, the old man leaned down and reached under his desk. A moment later, he pulled his hands back, filled with sparkling metal. Pushing the goblin ears to one side, he handed the coins to Mud. Now make sure to give half to Jabrax the Red. I will do so. The most beneficial way to follow that order were to give Jabrax half the coins that were worth less. The Copper Coins Its business concluded, Mud turned to leave. Before it completed, the golem suddenly had an idea. Turning back towards the old man, it asked a question. Where can I find a blacksmith I can afford that can complete a custom order within three days? End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.